it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. The Eleventh Hour by Raymond Beeman You've been sitting there for a while now. Just sitting there, stationary across from me. Just sitting, waiting, watching. His gaze seemed to emit a clear judgment, one of which he'd tried his very best to conceal, as a judgment would hardly have looked good against the backdrop of his attire. A judgment would make him look unclean. A judgment would make him look weak, and a judgment would render his faith obsolete. It would also expose his well-hidden hypocrisy, one of which his kind always ironically failed to see. His eyes, however, that bright blue shade which seemed to study me from across the desk, well, his eyes, they beautifully betrayed his true intent. Well, Daniel... The priest chose his first words carefully. Neither a question nor a statement, but together the two words were perfectly paired. Together they gave me an opening. Where do I begin? He took a moment to appreciate a thought, and when he was ready he once again spoke. How about the first? How was it you come to know that she was possessed? A slight smile spread across my lips. Well, Father, aside from the fact I find it incredibly humorous that I have to educate you in such things, well, I guess it started with the, um, feeling. A feeling, Daniel? Yes, Father, a feeling. What do you mean? The smile grew tighter against my features. He really doesn't know. Well, possession's more than just a physical act. Possession, well, possession's a wave, and just like the waters against the shore, Father, it continues to calm over and over, forever and then some, no pause, no break, no respite, and no moment for thought. It truly is endless. But just like the waves, we can feel it. A little breeze against the shore, those little noises of the water cascading as it breaks, they're all hints, Father, little clues, Little warnings, and these warnings are present and just as true when it comes to identifying a demon. A demon, Daniel. Yes, a demon, Father. He paused for a second, taking a moment to really appreciate the gravity of my words. Oh, you will know the righteous work that I have done. Okay, Daniel. How about we start with the first demon, then? My mind drifted back with little effort. Oh, the first was the worst, Father. Imagine a deep sleep, if you will, one of which you've been trapped within for so long. Imagine spending your life with your eyes closed, seeing the world through a frosted gaze, just assuming that all you've been told and all you've been taught was the truth, and, well, now imagine the moment of realization. Imagine finding out that Everything you'd ever thought, everything you'd ever assumed to be true, was no more than a lie. Imagining opening your eyes after thirty years, Father. Oh, imagine how blinding that truly is. The priest leant forward, his blue eyes narrowing in concentration. Tell me, Daniel, what happened the uh, first time? A warm feeling coursed through my body as the recollection materialized. Of course, the memory was a painful one, and, of course, the thought of what had occurred deeply disturbed me. But there was a glow hidden within the horror. After all, I may have seen true evil for the first time that morning, but evil cannot exist without the light. That may have been the morning that I came to accept the existence of the devil, but it was also the morning that I finally found God. He guides me. He will protect me. My mother? Yes, your mother. Well, the words were there, out in the open, suffocating the small room as they begged for an explanation. 
They held firm against the walls, infecting my surroundings with their sticky and nasty presence. My heart skipped slightly as I remembered her eyes. Her eyes used to be brown, Father. They were a dark brown. In the right light, they'd reflect brightly. All of us have brown eyes. My family, I mean. I guess that's genetics for you. Always lacking in an imagination. But to be clear, we never had her eyes. When she used to smile, her eyes would glow. You could always tell how happy my mother was, just from the glow in her eyes. And you could always tell whether she was feigning a smile. You see, that glow was never there when she was just pretending. Oh, I always remember that glow, Father. For many years, she had that little glow, you know. Well, that morning, there was no glow. There was no smile and there was no familiarity. That morning, the brown shade of her happiness was gone. Gone? Yeah, it was gone. Her eyes, Father, they were red. The priest moved back coughing slightly in surprise. Red, are you saying that her eyes were literally glowing red? I shook my head. Oh, how has he never seen this before? No, no, it's not as it sounds. It's not like the movies, you know. Life never is. When I say red, Father, I don't mean that her eyes were literally glowing. More that they contained something. Something which was not her. I suppose, for a lack of better word to describe them, they were red. And I guess we've been conditioned to associate red with danger. I suppose, but I don't know. I just know, as I said, that it was not her, and I could see it in her eyes. There was something there, and it had eaten her glow. I suppose you could say, it's one of those little clues that I mentioned to you before. One of those little hints. The ones that you can only ever truly see if you're ready to see it. It was, as I said, Father, a feeling. The priest paused as my words slowly sank in. Carefully he removed the glasses from his face and brought them down against his shirt as he began to clean the lenses. Mm, he's beginning to see the truth. Well, I think I understand, but there must have been something more. We wouldn't be having this conversation if that was it. I nodded my head. Yes, as I said, possession is endless. You see, that was the first time that I saw it. That morning. I was having breakfast. You know, just sitting there. Eating while worrying about all the usual things that people worry about at the beginning of the day. If you were to ask me now exactly what I was worried about, I honestly couldn't tell you. Oh, it all seems like so long ago. Another life. A concern for the person I no longer am, I guess. It was just a normal morning. A start like every other. Well, that is until she came into the kitchen. What happened next? On the surface of it, Father, not much. She spoke to me. She asked me about my plans for the day. She made herself breakfast and she hurried around our home, eager to get the last few things done before she left for work. Yeah, on the surface of it, it was just a normal Thursday morning. But possession, well, possession has many layers. To the untrained eye, the only thing that particular eye can ever hope to see is its surface. Now, admittedly, I was hardly as adept then as I am now, but that morning, well, that morning something happened to me. It was Godfather. That morning, he spoke to me. I could see it in his face. It was all over him in almost an instant. It oozed forth from his pores as it filled the room, coating the small confines in its horrid stink, hindering, suffocating, jealousy. I couldn't help but allow another smile to bless my features. Yes, Father, he spoke to me. Slowly the priest leant forward into the table, edging his interested ears close to my ever-telling mouth as he carefully placed the glasses back upon his face. And, uh, what did he tell you? Well, the smile on my lips almost hurt. Oh, it's hard to describe, but I'll try my best to convey what I was told. Imagine being told everything, and I mean 
everything all at once. Imagine all knowledge being bestowed upon you in an instant. Truth, meaning, fact, all of it. The words are, well, hard to put into words, but the sensation that they brought, oh, the sensation, was nothing short of pure light. Imagine a radiant warmth, the most beautiful of feelings never felt. Imagine his love, his dedication, his touch, blessing your soul and opening your consciousness to the immense and pleasurable truth that only he can bestow upon you. Well, it was love, Father. It was eternal love. I felt his hand upon me. I understood his sacrifice, and, well, in an instant, I knew what he was trying to tell me. The feeling inside of me was him, but the world around me, the world was filled with misery and caked in darkness. The world around of me and the feelings that it imparts upon all of us. The world oh, was nothing but a haven for the unholy. A sick charade, a prison and a construct. Designed to be perfect but long corrupted by those who are not meant to walk among us. And it was there, Father, during that realization that she smiled at me and I saw it. Or to be precise, I saw what was not there. Her glow. And that's how you come to know. Oh, no, Father, not really. I mean, I guess I did know at that point, but I really didn't want to admit it to myself. I told myself it was just suspicion, so, well, I decided to do what seemed logical. I waited. You waited? You waited for what? Oh, to be proved wrong, but unfortunately for both of us, my suspicions were proved to be correct. The priest paused for a moment and leant back into his chair, sighing deeply as he brought his hands up to his face. Uh, Daniel, this is a lot to take in. Please give me a moment to collect my thoughts. I allowed my words to wash over him. He seemed convicted in his faith, sure. He seemed steadfast in his belief. That much was apparent, but as I watched on from across the table... I couldn't help but question exactly how far along the path of truth his ideologies would allow him to tread. Would they permit him to see the truth he already knew? Would they allow him the clarity to identify the divine? Gradually, I began to question my choices. I, I, uh, I, well, I do not mean any disrespect, but are you really the right man for this job, Father? I mean, I've been told that you are. I've been reassured that you are the best person for this, but I'm beginning to have my doubts. Father, are you the man for me? Silence followed, the deafening sound piercing the room as the sounds of our breathing meshed nicely within the nothingness. Eternity seemed to linger, hanging in the air along with my question as it drifted aimlessly, awaiting acknowledgement, waiting to be free. Finally, after a few short moments... He once again sighed and moved back into the table. We are all God's children, Daniel, and we all deserve to be listened to, especially now. A smirk burned its way onto my lips. Are you sure, Father? Are you sure that this is not too much for one sitting? Well, Daniel, I just hope that my faith is strong enough to hear the rest. Ah, oh, perfection. I knew that he was in awe. I knew that he was savouring every moment, every little descriptive word of an experience that he could only ever dream of. I knew that he wanted to be me, but I also knew, realistically, without the knowledge I'd been given, that this was a lot for one person to take, regardless of the faith that they may decide to wrap themselves within. I was effectively outing the devil, and not everyone, even those closest to the Bible included, were yet ready to acknowledge his existence. Well, that was his greatest trick, you know. To fool us into believing that he did not exist. An unexpected chuckle escaped from me then. <laughs> Got it in one, Father. Well, the priest ignored my misplaced laughter, and instead straightened his glasses before once again posing a question. Where are we? My mother? That's right. Your mother. My mind buzzed slightly as it returned to the event. 
Well, she was the first that I saw, but after her. I came to see the truth wherever I went. It was in the shop when I went to buy milk. It was at my place of work, in the mall, in the streets, outside of my home. They were not always there, but they were in enough places for me to be concerned. I could see them everywhere, Father. I could actually see the world. The real world. It was terrifying. I'll admit there were some nights, the darkest of nights, when I questioned his will. I mean, after all, why me? Why had I been given this? Why had I been trusted with his hand? Yeah, there were some nights, a little too many for my liking. One too many, I'll embarrassingly admit. But I did, just a little bit, I did question his will. But honestly, and I do say this with nothing held back, those nights were far and few between. For every night I questioned the path, for every night that I wondered whether I was really the right person for his divine plan, there were easily a hundred nights when I carried out his will without restraint, and for that I know that my place in his heaven is just, that my place by his side is secure. God, he hates the truth. I could see it once again within him, the rotten stench of jealousy moving from him as it outed his pride, dirtying his religious attire with its everlasting and lingering presence. It clung to him, and it was louder than his words. And what of Frederick Price? Oh, Frederick Price. I try not to recall their human names, Father. It would be a disservice to the skin that they left behind. Oh, after all, what wore their faces was anything but holy. Hmm, quiet. I could see that this was getting to him. I didn't blame him. I remember that morning, so long ago, that morning when my eyes were finally opened and just how hard it had been to accept the reality of life after hearing his words. I remembered the gravity of the realization. I remembered the weight of his will so I knew entirely just how cumbersome that the truth could be. I didn't blame him, even if he did wear his faith proudly. It was a lot to accept, even for a man of God. Irony, as humorous as it was, really is a fickle thing. Frederick Price. The priest remained silent, instead responding with a simple nod. Well, um, he was a second demon that I encountered, and he was, to put it bluntly, a moment of clarity of sorts. You see, before him I tried, albeit without result, to save the vessel that the demon had infested. I tried it all, all of it, practiced upon what used to be my mother. I had researched, I would read, I would learned, and I would fought for answers, but with Frederick, well, with him, I came to realize that whatever wore his face was, as I said, anything but holy. Frederick showed me the vessel could not be saved and that the child of God could only ever be cleaned by his hand alone. Frederick opened my eyes to a certain degree with more relevance than his message ever truly conveyed. Frederick showed me the continuation of the path. He showed me how to navigate the predicament and ultimately how to rid the world of the infestation. He showed me how to save a soul. Show me how to fulfill my purpose. Without him, I was no more than an ant attempting to understand the motivations of man. And for that alone, well, that's the only reason I would ever besmirch his soul by referencing his name. Oh, Frederick left this world a long time ago. He's with the Creator now. The thing that took his identity, well, that is back with an entirely different Creator. With the Devil? Yes, Father with the devil. The priest sighed once again and moved back from the table, taking a moment to steady his mind as the stark nature of my admission washed over him. God, he is not strong enough to wield the might of God. And for a few seconds he remained silent, obviously attempting to reconcile my story against his pre-existing fate. His blue eyes moved back and forth as his mind absorbed my message and then... Just at the moment when I was about to speak, he spoke, stopping my words short within my mouth. It is the uh, eleventh hour, Daniel. I believe that we are out of time. Out of time? 
father already? Oh, I have so much more to tell you. Please, let me guide you as he has guided me. The priest shook his head. Daniel, you know that's not the reason why I came. I agreed to be here under strict guidelines, and thankfully, you've kept to them for your part. So please, let us finish this in a civil manner. I've done what I came here to do. I've heard your final confession. I've listened to your ramblings, I've indulged your delusions, and I've held firm in the face of your evil. Father? The priest shook his head, the disappointment within its motion unsettling in an obvious sort of way. What? You want me to absolve you of your sins, Daniel? Do you expect that because I'm a man of God that I will wave a hand and grant your passage into eternal salvation? Is it that you fear what is about to come? Is this the reason why you summoned me here moments before? Well, I am not your saviour, Daniel. It's clear that you turned your back on him a very long time ago. Oh, he's still here with me. No, no, you could never understand his love. You're a charlatan. You prayed around in those clothes. You prayed around in your faith, and you think that you're a better man than me. He spoke to me, father. He chose me. Inside of me, within these layers that you consider evil, is a love which you could never comprehend. I am his hand, and I am the answer. I am the dam against the flood of evil which washes over his shore. I am the last line. I am forever, and I will take my rightful place by his side, just as it is meant to be. You should repent, because, believe me, Father, he does not have time for false prophets. And again, eternity shone bright. Time slowed, and all sound within the room escaped from the walls. The world outside ceased to exist, as he locked his never-ending blue gaze upon me, his judgmental eyes burning a blazing hole through the space which housed my soul. A serenade of footsteps echoed from the hallway outside, and then the sound of the door opening behind brought time screaming back into reality. The guards moved behind of me, and unshackled my hands from the table, while the priest looked down with a clear and unwavering superiority. Ah, oh, never before have truer words been spoken. I will pray for you, Daniel. And with that, I was gone. I was led from the room, out into the bright hallway, and away from his words as the guards ushered me down the corridor. I'd prove him wrong so clear to me now. He wasn't ready to accept the truth. I'd been naive to assume that he would just accept my words. After all, my words did not contain the necessary sincerity in order to convey their heavenly intent. I was just a messenger. I was not he who had spoken the truth. Yes, it was clear to me now that nobody would ever accept the reality of evil. Nobody would ever acknowledge the struggle I had been through what I had done to cleanse this plane. It was a truth that followed me into the next room, a truth which lingered as they tightened the restraints around my arms. It persisted and it screamed as the needle sank slowly in through my flesh, piercing my vessel while guiding me home. I am a shepherd to a blind and hopelessly lost flock. Resolution buzzed throughout my veins as a faint smile struggled to form. I am coming, and I am ready for your love. The Demons Inside My Head When the persistent existential crisis finally started weighing my sanity down, the minutiae stature of my persona started to dwindle, and the dream of longevity became long forgotten. I then decided to leave my artificially lit abode in search of more natural luminescence. When the thoughts of self-annihilation started fondling with my sanity, and my health degraded even further, I decided to let myself out into the woods with whatever ounce of energy I had in my consumptive shell, to prevent those obnoxious thoughts from interfering with my conscience. 
I decided to move to Vermont. As for the queer stillness and calmness of my brain, even after all these hideous cataclysms, is another inexplicable prospect. To say it was all a product of some wild, hideous imagination is just to blatantly ignore the plainest facts of my tenure. To say it was an adverse effect of my persistent ailment, or just pure unearthly phantasms, is just plain stupidity, and disgusted me when Nancy regarded it with a pinch of her unbearable laughter, her answer to everything, a detestable laughter followed by her toothy grin. Every reflection held the same grotesqueness in my squalid sullen, sparsely lit home, wearied by the same melancholic sight. I tore apart every mirror before leaving, burned every work, fumes of which reminded me of my transient uproar, fame, and my equally short-lived writing career. Every little anomaly in those sinister, unlit, damp corridors reminded me of my futile decisions, flaws which resided in the nethermost point of my soul, refusing to show up. Every picture frame radiated a different tale of my short-lived career. Every little aching step I took, painfully reverberated, dictated a thousand years of struggle in my tortured ears. Tottering and floundering in the confines of my own home, my day dissipated into nothingness, and evenings into oblivions. Night. My body shudders from the very thought of the nocturnal hours. Chills run down my spine from the hideous thoughts of it. Nights were the worst of all. It brought those cries. Oh, God, those wails, those sick clamours, despite the insidious outward winds in its direction. Those shrieks, those demonic shrieks, always induced a disproportionate amount of grotesqueness in my nightly fantasies, often keeping me up in the morbid fear that I shall be mangled in the same noxious way that Nancy was. During the nocturnal hours, I felt my mental bandwidth contracting. To my mind, it all felt like a wicked phantasm created by Satan himself. A curious case of night terrors. I laughingly exclaimed this to myself, shunning the most obvious of peculiarities. As time went on, the signs became more wicked. He started to manifest more. At some point in time, it felt like he scrutinized my habits, for it would only appear when I was alone and idle, and at the nadir of my mental and physical well-being. I sometimes attributed this to my ailing body, or loneliness, which took refuge in my body, refusing to believe he exists, but the omens were crystal clear. My coming to Vermont had been an utter failure, for whence I looked, I saw traces of my failures, for this sinister place aggravated my illness and has pushed me on to the brink of my untimely extinction. My mind didn't seem to work rationally there, even transiently, for, for the nature I so dearly sought looked uninterested and inanimate. Though even after the abhorrent nature of those woods, that cryptical place still reminded me of my melodious hours, from where everything went downhill. Down unlit, the interminable patriarch of those sinister trees resided my wicked ailment, which drove my sanity to self-annihilation and extinction. Life became an existential horror for me, and it all started after I first met her. I saw her for the first time, in the fall of thirty, walking briskly as if in some hurry. Her hair, though, oh, those hairs. She had exquisite red colour to her hair. Looked as if she would get lost within those woods and would never be found if it were not for those red hairs. Her aura magnified the eloquence of the place. The rays bent around her body, giving her a satisfying and elegant look. I knew I needed to talk to her. Making my way down the alley, I tried adjusting my pace to match hers, still keeping my heartbeats within scrutinization levels. The soft winter air displayed no signs of surcease. The wind had a certain crisp quality to it, a soothing aura which was now mixing with my overflowing anxiety and excitement. 
I was made to stop abruptly when she turned around all at once, making me stop like a deer who got caught cold up front some speeding headlights. I was the deer then. I finally yelled, Hi! A confused yet so eloquent face looked back, and in those microseconds eons passed from me. Every Einsteinian lecture, every Euclidean geometry, and, and all Newtonian physics took an abrupt halt as I witnessed time dilation within normal circumstances. I laugh upon this now. My lips convulsed in an undignified haste as I stuttered, stuttered and stuttered, finally uttering some sensible composition of words barely comprehensible. My speech was cut short as some voice straight from heaven interrupted my lustful gaze and asked me in the most innocent face ever, Sir, you look lost. May I help you? Apart from her hair, the one thing that stood out the most, which was not palpable from behind her, were those exotic eyes. Oh, those shimmering eyes, like a pale full moon shining maliciously on a cold, damp winter night. The words which next came would forever remain inexplicable to my fading sanity, the origins of which I dare not fathom in my miserable state. I somehow complimented her on her eyes. You've got beautiful eyes, ma'am. She instantly blushed, for I was no bad-looking fellow for my age, five foot eleven and weighing nearly a hundred and fifty-five pounds. I knew. I had a pure chance here. You've got some mesmerizing gaze, too. She hit back shyly on me. From there, to cut things short, my world changed. Always revolved around her, most amazingly. Whether it was a simple quiz victory at the university or, or a menacing feud, she had to know everything. Now, for once, love is a horribly difficult emotion to describe. For some impeccable personas of society, it's just a mechanism of reproduction, necessary for the continued existence of all life forms on Earth, and a severe distraction while for the loathsome genres of society, the low dwellers, presumably, it's their world. And for me, she was my world. Amazingly, no one hated on us. Eons passed on, and eternities were to pass next, but Something malicious hindered our ephemeral way to eternal happiness. The thing is, besides all the fantastic habits she had, she also had a corrupted one which just plain obliterated every other. It's cancer, they said. Procrastination, I wondered, in my hyperactive mind. The corrupted habit of her. She procrastinated in everything. Her appointments, her meds, the symptoms which she ignored with morbid levity. The lump jarred a fiendish look as it grew insidiously all the way. Certain heaviness in the air surrounded us. It dared to engulf us in that room. The doctor, wearing a pale smile, a blank expression, continued to babble incoherently about the chances, the risk and cost-effective insurance. Dread and restrained fear drooled through her eyes as she let out a forceful smile. The smile etched into my soul, in the deepest of corners. A plethora of memories incessantly flooded my mind on the funeral day. To say I scarcely enjoyed the abysmal weather would be a sin, but it doesn't matter now. It is better to have loved and lost than never to have loved before, I reminded myself. Loving a nihilist is a hard but erudite experience. Turning him sane, swerving off nihilism, removing it from the equation is even harder, but for the sane to turn back into a nihilist is a tragedy. Unfortunately, the latter came true for my depraved nihilistic self. I decided to move back to Vermont, to spend the rest of my days in recluse, and focus once again on the betterment of my degrading writing career, which once brought me transient fame. I finally set out for Battleboro. 
The laughter lines accumulated through vigorous usage of superioris and resorius were slowly fading away into oblivion. The serene, picturesque scenery unfolded in front of me in a beautiful way. It looked even sinister somehow, for I was well acquainted with the legends surrounding the Vermont woods, the stories, the tales my grandparents told me when I was still a kid. I shunned my delusional thoughts, delirious with the tragic cataclysms, the grief and the overwhelming sadness it was experiencing. I got out of the motor car and trudged painfully towards my abode. The Vermont woods looked so calm and inviting. The thick canopy laden with wildlings allowed little sunlight to reach the squalid surface, the moss-covered ground stretching for a thousand miles in either way. Wildlife was sprawling in the place, bugs, insects and rodents all peacefully inhabiting the still untouched parts of the forests, still not plagued by the sins of mankind. It was still daytime when I arrived in Vermont. The atmosphere grew colder as I inched slowly towards my edifice. Thick, dark clouds formed over the horizon. Ah, the Vermont weather, I chuckled back, thinking to myself how dearly I missed the weather, as the city's garish luminescence didn't allow even reminiscing. Past moss-covered ground, overgrown bushes and vociferous fauna, I reached my destination. A cheerful and familiar face greeting me. Nancy. She was the caretaker appointed way back. The ominous signs of aging didn't hold her back from shouting my name so loudly and vehemently it may very well have been heard in the whole of Brattleboro. Her face now revealed the wrath of time, wrinkled and corrugated. Hands trembling, feet tremulous, still enough to carry around joyously, a face which was once smeared with elegant freckles, now displayed none. The house was the same as ever since I left it, except for a beautiful foliage of leaves gathered around aesthetically. Birds chirped monotonically around the premise. The tree line had receded back, but the branches still covered most of the facade. The crisp, raspy sound of dry leaves crunching under my feet gave my dreary mind a much-needed solace. The country wind swerved my surliness away. Smiling exultantly, I walked into my home. The first rays of evening greeted me, repelling my irritation away. The smell of wood, the sound of it creaking under my aching feet, washed my sanity with a new sense of euphoria, causes unknown. Ah, a soothing respite from my daunting ennui, I thought to myself, as I languorously skimmed past my precarious belongings. I spent most of my days huddled up in my study, making myself involved in some dreary work as every new feeling of gratification was soon washed down by persistent reminiscence and nostalgia. Sometimes betwixt inextricable work and grief, I would hear muffled, distant echoes of cheerful kids coming from afar, past innumerable trees and dense forests. I would then imaginatively join in on their conversations and laughs. Living in seclusion wasn't a problem as the majority of my life went in recluse. As evenings would draw closer, I would then clumsily wander around my property in hopes of finding rabbits which I'd spotted from the upstairs windows. Those little creatures reminded me of another fictional creature, Mateguas. Some evenings, when I was too ill and fragile to walk around, Nancy would accompany me in my amble pace. She would often relay to me the fantastic legends surrounding these woods, the tales of Abenaki tribe and several other mythical beasts of distinct and unclear origin. Vermont is usually associated with sprawling flora and brilliant ostentatious forests. Seldomly and, and only even then, a meagre quantity of adult population would associate it with the supernatural. So, sometimes when Nancy told me the tales of Giwaka, an evil man-eating ice giant of Abenaki Indian legends, similar to the Wendigo, filled my mind with dread whilst mention of few mythical creatures sparked childhood fantasy inside of me. 
Miko, a mischievous raccoon, a light-hearted Abenaki trickster figure, falls in the latter category. Nancy seemed a definite connoisseur in Vermont's legends, although she never explained the origins of such fantastic erudition. My life never steered around the spectral dimension too much to have a discussion or ponder over. The prospect of the supernatural never entertained me or vied for my attention, so when it happened to me, it left me dumbfounded. I shunned it to me being paranoid, tired or just imagining things, but well, every time I stepped into the tree line, out of my usual perimeter, a palpable feeling of dread gripped me. Something always seemed amiss, regardless of the tenure of my presence there. Yes, it was betwixt these tales of Vermont legends and my evening strolls when I first caught glimpse of something preternatural. I was spending the usual inimitable time amongst the several luxuriances nature had to provide, and suddenly a feeling of dread, an ominous feeling, took over my body. The usual walk time was already over, I realized. This realization came late, owing to my weird fascination with the blue warbler, a local bird. The calm, serene atmosphere suddenly took a violent turn as I turned to walk towards my house. I then caught a glimpse of something otherworldly. I stood, frozen in fear and confusion, and began to notice another sinister oddity. The sky had changed. The sky had a vivid red tinge to it. I started repeating the Lord's Prayer. A soft humming sound sparsely echoed around me. Rapid movements escaped from my peripheral vision. Shadows of despicable grotesqueness floated around me. The soft humming sound, now more like a demonic enchantment. A horrible, eldritch entity lurked around me. I wondered frantically and fearfully. Then it appeared in one of the upstairs windows. Long hair, wide-eyed, possessing a maniacal grin. At first glance, it appeared as if someone was merely looking through the old antediluvian window panes, but Nancy was in town that day. The house was vacant, bathed in utter emptiness, except for me, something unidentifiable. The demonic entity vanished into thin air. Ah, being outside, in an obscure world, watching helplessly as something otherworldly seizes hold of your only safe haven, is a terrifying ordeal. Nothing more happened that day. Nancy arrived the next morning. Oh, you ain't leaving any time soon. I ordered her, as soon as she stepped inside, in a strict tone. A look of utter confusion grabbed her wrinkled face. Okay, sir, she replied, still confused from the amount of contempt in my speech. Daytime, the place, the nearby trail of trees, looked calm as ever, scintillating even. Nighttime was a different story altogether, and by virtue of some horrible, blasphemous fate, I can't quite fathom it was only me who always saw the terrible deeds, the shadow lurking amongst those sinister beds of trees, the lone bearer of that sinister, demonic cacophony. Several trivial incidents followed later, but nothing catastrophic or of cyclopean importance. At one point in time, I regarded it to my ravaging malady, toying with my dwindling fantasy, but... What happened next eradicated these merciful doubts. It was late in the night. The cold winter wind blew mercilessly, aggravating the pain between my joints. I was helplessly bedridden. Wearied by the melancholic biblical fables I resigned myself to, staring out into the cold, vast plains of sheer nothingness. It was during my uninterrupted gaze when I heard a queer sound. I listened patiently and recognized it as hard, thumping footsteps coming from the floor below. Someone was scurrying down below. The sound of hurried footsteps echoed hideously in the hall. 
I mustered all my strength and called, Nancy, in a stern and strident tone while still in my bed, but to no avail. Nancy, I called out again. The anger in my speech grew to a barbaric volume. She won't get to evade the dreadful consequences tomorrow morning, I thought to myself, anger pouring all over my body. Then an ear-piercing screeching sound of the basement door opening emanated in the hallway below. Is it Nancy? I thought again to myself. What was she doing so late down in the basement? The sinister sound of wood creaking was slowly creeping closer and closer. Rays of inexplicable intensities illuminated the interior of my household. Shadows of unspeakable stature formed before me, and a low, guttural, demonic voice echoed in the hallway. It wasn't her, I realized. The gate handle shook maniacally. Layers of dust came off the floor and the wall. I couldn't help myself but think, what was she up to this whole time? Her idiocy has enraged me before, and this time it has left me in a haunting situation. Did she somehow leave the backyard's gate ajar? How should I deal with this intruder? The questions knew no bound. Panic seized me. The gate handle shook hysterically now, as the low, mysterious growl increased in audacity even more. The intruder didn't sound like any human being at this point. It was something supernatural. A being of the night, I wondered frantically. I desperately looked for somewhere to hide. Something to block the incoming pandemic. Something to keep the atrocious beast at bay. Something to evade my grisly death. I couldn't find one. In a sudden fit of mass hysteria and disillusion, I decided to jump from the window. The pale moonlight cast weird, uncanny shadows onto the backyard. The tree line had hideously crawled forward ever so slightly. I landed awkwardly onto the withered surface. My legs burned from the pain. The wind picked up a severe pace. The swaying branches emanated horrid resonance that no sane human ear should have heard. Then, what came next even perplexes me now. To the reader, not so much, but something queerly inexplicable happened on that full moon night in those forgotten hideous parts of Vermont. A loud, obnoxious bang followed by the curious sound of shards of wood falling onto the wooden surface. The deep growl reached a crescendo that night, that abhorrent night. I looked back curiously from the tree line into my bedroom, scared what sight it may be presented to behold. Curiosity, morbid curiosity, overpowered the subtle insidious fear in me, but nothing ever came from the dark bedroom. It appeared as if the demonic beast was waiting for its prey to return to its confines. I ran even deeper into the woods, leaving Nancy alone with that demonic creature. She deserves this despicable treatment, I thought to myself. My legs ached violently from the fall. Unutterable pain filled my body. My legs gasped for specks of air as the harsh, blowing wind displayed no mercy in slowing my pace. And into a clearing fell my consumptive and tremulous body, the sullen, blanched face meeting the ground first. I woke up to a gruesome sight of a snake engulfing its tail in my backyard. I let out a high-pitched squeal. Gross, I uttered numbly to myself, still visibly shaken. Unheeded questions stormed in my brain. How did I reach my backyard? I raced my way to my bedroom. The door, the sinister door, looked good as ever. Why was the hideous door still intact? The impeccable sound of it breaking into trivialities was surely audible, even in my frenzied state. Nancy's detestable face greeted me on my way down from my bedroom. A horrified expression covered her usual cheerful facade. Sire, you have blood on your face. Sudden feelings of anger and confusion rose inside of me. Oh, I was hunting, I said in an utter 
derogatory tone. Blood was smeared all over my squalid face. Hundreds of thoughts raced in my still nauseous mind as I desperately prepared to flee. Since the scarcity in sources of travel, it was mere impossible to arrange motor cars to travel back this late in the day. Perpetual rain had already deteriorated the outskirts. It was impossible. Leaving by foot was never an option. I had to spend the night. One sinister night in those doomed parts of Brattleboro forests. One ominous night betwixt unknown nocturnal cryptids. Against the violent revolts of my fearful brain, I decided to stay. Morning came and went without anything happening. I remained in my study all day, huddled up in a corner with only the sun's warm effulgence to guide my wearied body around. The warm, sultry atmosphere made the study a comfortable resting place. I woke up around five to the ubiquitous chirping of several distinct bird species. The irradiate rays of sun acquired vivid, iridescent colours. The last rays of dusk, before the tormenting night, reached through my window pane onto the open piece of my incomplete writing. Ah, another impeccable idea which wore away with time, I wondered. For some strange reasons, I found none of the hallway lights working. Queer coolness in the evening wind signaled the break of another malicious storm. Ever since my childhood, storms have been fascinating for me. I decided to steal a glance from one of the hallway windows. The thick canopy nearly engulfed everything, it seemed. The fog had started to settle in the nearby tree line. The wind had picked up a severe pace now, as I, bewildered on the fantastic force of nature, something caught my attention. Oh, I still dearly hope that I shouldn't have pulled those curtains up. I shouldn't have peeped. My head still hurts from the awful visual which unfolded before my bleak eyes, now devoid of even the plainest of colours. Even after eternities, when the clouds roar, the lightning strikes or the fog settles in, a strange feeling of disproportionate fear mixed with the ever-declining childhood fantasy rise inside of my shuddering body. I then like to steer away from any window or orifice. I behave irrationally then. As I stood dumbstruck from the raging storm, a strange, ghastly creature peeked back at me from the hideous tree line, several limbs disjointed. The abhorrent creature was floating somehow, long hair covering most of its face, a strange vile liquid dripping from its rotting body. The being stood, leering, protruding a demented, ungodly look, an ominous grin at me. I immediately backed away from the window. Something wicked was coming my way. Nancy, I yelled frantically. She was nowhere to be seen. Weird, ghastly figures escaped in my peripheral. The house was uncannily darker than the rest of the days. Outside, the storm gained full momentum. A single flash of lightning bolt sent me racing back into my study. The place which was the only safe haven, excluded and in recluse from the rest of the world. The satisfying click of dead bolts echoed in the empty room. I drifted back. Something in the cool autumnal wind made me seek the perpetual solace of sleep once again. Around half past twelve, a menacing, demonical shriek was heard coming from the basement. I got up from my deep slumber, still noticeably hazy and incoherent. The sounds of nocturnal hours and heavy downpour greeted me as I opened my creaking door. A new sense of horror and oppression filled my mind as I sensed something horrific was about to manifest itself hideously in front of my bloodshot eyes. I cursed my creaking door for sounding too loud, for I was too afraid to seek the attention of whatever nictophiliac decided to seek refuge in my home on this dreary, haunting night. 
It took me a few seconds to notice the basement door was hurtling in and out, creating the same deafening, ear-piercing, screeching noise. Nancy, I called out. No answer. Nancy, I called out again. Still no answer. Heaven propagated no mercy as buckets of rainwater were splashing onto my roof every second. The lightning flashes became more and more violent. The swerving tress outside the window jarred a weird, inexplicable, haunting look, as now and then sinister flashes illuminated those horrid branches. I decided to take a horrific decision to confront, to confront, whatever abhorrent abomination resided in the nethermost points of my rotting abode. The wooden stairs decided to turn their back against me as they mercilessly creaked on the way down. Then came the hallway. For some strange, peculiar reason, Nancy forgot to shut off the blinds. I could swear I saw movements betwixt the bushes, the shrubs, and those sick trees. Vile, putrid smells emanated from the hall. The screeching sound grew more violent as I inched my way closer to the devil. Unspeakable pain protruded in my left leg as I tripped on a piece of wooden furniture and let out a low yelp. The pain soon vanished into oblivion as something altogether different made my sanity disappear into nothingness. The last nail in the coffin, I suppose, as after that period I remember scarcely of the events. As it was at that moment I decided to finally get away from that impious, sacrilegious land. As I tripped on the wooden chair, I glanced under it for a moment, and under it laid the dead, lifeless remains of Nancy her eyes still wide open from shock or fear, the origins of which still remain unclear. The cause of her horrific mutilation may very well remain an unsolved, perplexed mystery to the authorities as well. Several of her limbs missing, chewed out at best. I let out a horrific scream, and in no way tried to muffle my reaction, as whatever laid down in the basement was not my concern any more. Painstakingly, I got up, ready to dart outside under the night sky, into the damp, unforgiving woods. And suddenly the thing downstairs did not feel the urge to entertain the idea of living downstairs any more. The basement door wasn't moving now. The stairs, those hellish steps leading towards the basement, now creaked horridly, one by one. Step by step, something was making its way towards the upper level, towards me, to do whatever it had done to Nancy. I raced my way outside, leaping the mangled corpse of Nancy lying down there, in a desperate attempt to slow down the maniac who was now, free from whatever unearthly bounds had kept him dormant down in the basement. The downpour was still rampant. The flashes no longer unveiled sinister Arcanus, but now blinded me too, I heard my front door tear open in a quick frenzy, and a growl of hysterical rage was now emanating in the woods in either direction. The portentous canopy stretched out into the vast, interminable night sky, which once fascinated me, but now induced an outrage of fear in my depraved vessel. I tripped again. Something snapped in the lower parts of my torso. Shards of pain radiated in my body. I was hurt miserably, but... Despite the aching pain, I continued my helpless and futile run in hopes of finding a hiding spot to spend the rest of the night in to prevent myself from stumbling onto the same miserable fate that dear Nancy had met, to prevent myself from coming across the same untimely demise. Though, as a result of some horrific past life deeds or just pure blasphemous fate, I shall not fathom. My legs finally gave way, and I fell face down into a squalid ditch, sprawling with all kind of micro-life, abundant with small rodents and insects of various grotesqueness, the only speck of wildlife I encountered on that dreaded, ungrateful night. My drudgerous life was over, I thought mercilessly to myself, still lying lethargically in the dirt. The sounds of heavy footsteps echoed in the nearby tree line surrounding me. 
I tried to lay still, in a last desperate attempt to camouflage myself in the night. It went in vain, just like my every other folly attempt to seek refuge from the unnamed. Then, finally, came the dreaded abnormality which I still dearly believe is responsible for the horrific annihilation of Nancy. Conjured up from the deepest recesses of hell, the cacodemonical being stood towering before me, staring blankly into my soul with those hollowed-out feverish eyes. I laid still, unmoving. Those eyes. I still shiver by the very thoughts of those eyes. Those eyes were the worst of all. It still induces a disproportionate amount of nightmares in my transient sleeps. Those tormenting, feverish eyes made my soul shiver. My trivial existence trembled in front of the cyclopean monstrosity which now stood uncannily still in the night. The sinister flash revealed a plethora of other fiendish details. The being stood on its hind legs. It may have been a carnivore at some point of its abnormal life. Queerly enough, it looked humanoid in shape, not much different from a regular human. And, with almost inhuman speed, it disappeared back into the tree line. The terrifying encounter left me pondering on the palpable concern. Why was I still alive? Soon after, my mind faded into obscurity. Sleep came as a deliverance. In my dream, though, I saw those eyes again, those haunting, abysmal eyes, reflecting nothing but darkness and grief. Dread, doom and despair dripped from those eyes, even guilty somehow, but what are regret and remorse to a deranged monstrosity like that? I soon found out. I woke up bathed in garish effulgence, physical pain no longer in existence. The room felt extremely bright, weird machinery beeping in unanimous monotone. A hospital room of some sort. Captivated by some uncanny lustrous metal, my struggle proved to be extremely futile. A nurse, probably in her mid-twenties, entered the grim room. She understood the palpable disillusion. I asked her to clear the phantasm, steer me away from the irradiate refuge of delusion and lies. I wasn't prepared for the truth, though. I never had been. The wonder and awe, the fascination I once had for the human brain, now stood muddled up in a damp corner of my rotting sanity. For the fear that those demented visions would never really leave my depraving sanity and would swerve my dying body back into the recesses of lunacy. Just like that slithering reptile who was en route to eating its tail, carving my way towards eternal damnation, I ate my decaying sanity all along just like that venomous reptile. She explained the horrific truth for the umpteenth time, I speculated, wandering from her bleak and expressionless face. It had been years since I had been apprehended. I am in a lunatic asylum for the criminally insane and was found guilty of killing Nancy, stabbing her multiple times in her sleep. The sick disease exaggerated, magnified my insidious hate for her. Disheartened by the disorientation of my disjointed visions, I decided not to argue. I was never a rabid beast in those Vermont woods. Just my imagination, just my dementia-stricken brain and a cruel, disdain phantasm that has driven me hideously to an unimaginable and unspeakable end. But I refuse to believe her, and I never will. No, it was never the dementia that killed Nancy and made me insane, but the demon, the sick, abhorrent abomination inside my ever-decaying brain. So, a couple of really cool demonic possession stories for you this evening. 
What do you think of those? Always um, like to get a bit of feedback from you all. The kind of stories you want me to read. I've been doing some of the old school sci-fi stuff from back in the 1930s recently. And to be honest, um, I just really enjoy it. But uh, I want to know if you enjoy it too. Otherwise, <laughs> I'll stop. Uh, a couple of thematic stories there on demonic possession, as I said. Uh, both um, really cool. Shared directly with me in Dr. Creepen's vault. The subreddit I set up so you could share your stories with me and I'll read them all back to you. So yeah, another call for um, any stories you might have that you'd like me to read. Can't promise I'll read all of them, but I do my best. Um, well, yeah, as I was saying over on the subreddit today, I'd love to update message of uh, my life situation. All's good, but um, when it comes to stories, uh, I don't know, kind of just have to do what I feel like on the day. So uh, if you've shared a story with me, I'm sure it's awesome, but it might take me well, a year, a year and a half, two years to get around to reading it. Or I might do it within hours of you sharing it with me. And um, this is just, it has to be on um, like a feeling basis. What do I feel like reading on any particular day? So um, it's nothing personal. If it takes me ages or I don't get around to reading it for a long time, it is just a case of what do I feel like reading today? What am I in the mood for? Okay, so hope you understand. Well, that's Monday evening. Back again very soon. Till the next time. Very, very sweet dreams, everyone. Bye-bye.